Aloha class, welcome to uh, the first and second part of the book by David Attenborough uh, called A Life on Our Planet. We're reading the introduction and 1937. Introduction, our greatest mistake. Pripyat in the Ukraine is a place unlike anywhere else I have been. It is a place of utter despair. On the face of it, it seems quite a pleasant town with avenues, hotels, a square, a hospital, parked with fairground rides, a central post office, a railway station. It has several schools and swimming pools, cafes and bars, a restaurant by the river, shops, supermarkets and hairdressers, a theater and a cinema, a dance hall, gymnasiums and a football stadium with an athletics track. It has all the amenities we humans have brought into existence to give us a com content and com content and comfortable life. All the elements of our homemade habitat. Surrounding the town's cultural and commercial center are the, apart the apartments. There are 160 towers built at specified angles to a well-considered grid of roads, each equipped the apartment has its own balcony, each tower its own laundry. The tallest towers reach almost 20 stories high, and each is crowned with a giant iron hammer and sickle, the emblem of the town's creators. Pripyat was built by the Soviet Union, Soviet Union in one busy period of construction in the 1970s. It was the, the designed perfect home for about 50,000 people, a modernist utopia to suit the very best engineers and scientists in the Eastern Bloc, together with their young families. Amateur film footage from the early 1980s shows them smiling, mingling, and pushing prams on the wide boulevards, taking ballet classes, swimming in the Olympic-sized pool, and boating on the river. Yet no one lives in Pripyat today. The walls are crumbling, its windows are broken, its lintels are collapsing. I have to watch my step as I explore its dark, empty buildings. Chairs lie on their backs in the hairdressing salon, surrounded by dusty curlers and broken mirrors. Fluorescent tubes hang down from the supermarket ceiling. The parquet floors of the town hall is ripped up and scattered down the length of a grand marble staircase. Exercise books litter the floors of schoolrooms, neat Cyrillic handwriting scoring the pages in blue ink. I find the pools emptied. The seats of the sofas in the apartments have dropped to the floor. The beds are rotten. Almost everything is motionless, paused. If something is stirred by a gust of wind, it startles me. With each new doorway you enter, the lack of people becomes more and more preoccupying. Their absence is the truth is the truth that is most present. I visited other post-human towns, Pompeii, Angkor Wat, Machu Picchu, but here the normality of the place forces your attention on the abnormality of its abandonment. Its structures and contrumants are so familiar that you know their dis disuse cannot simply be due to the passing of ages. Pripyat is a place of utter despair because everything here, from the not notice boards that are no longer looked at, to the discarded slide rules in the science classroom, to the shattered piano in the cafe, is a monument to the capacity of humankind to lose everything it needs and everything it treasures. We humans, alone on Earth, are powerful enough to create worlds and then to destroy them. On the 26th of April, 1986, a reactor number four on of the nearby Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Lenin nuclear power plant, known to everyone today as Chernobyl, exploded. The explosion was the result of bad planning and human error. The design of Chernobyl's reactors had flaws. The operating staff were not aware of these and, in addition, were careless in their work. Chernobyl exploded because of mistakes, the most human explanation of all. 400 times more radioactive material than that expelled by the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs combined was sent over much of Europe on high winds. It fell from the skies and raindrops and snowflakes entered the soils and waterways of many nations. Ultimately, it broke into the food chain. The number of premature deaths caused by the event is still disputed, but estimates range into the hundreds of thousands. Many have called Chernobyl the most costly environmental catastrophe in history. History. Sadly, this isn't true. Someone else, something else has been unfolding everywhere across the globe, barely noticeable from day to day for much of the last century. This too is happening as the result of bad planning and human error. Not one hapless accident, but a damaging lack of care and understanding that affects everything we do. It didn't begin with a single explosion. It started silently, before anyone realized it, as a result of causes that are multifarious, global, and complex. Its fallout cannot be detected by a single instrument. It has taken hundreds of studies across the world to confirm that it is even happening. Its effects will be far more profound than the containment contamination of soils and waterways in a few unfortunate countries. It could ultimately lead to the destabilization and collapse of everything we rely upon. This is the true tragedy of our time, the spiraling decline of our planet's biodiversity. For life to truly thrive on this planet, there must be immense biodiversity. Only when billions of different individual organisms make the most of every resource and opportunity they encounter, and millions of species lead lives that interlock so they can sustain each other, can the planet run efficiently. The greater the biodiversity, the more secure will be all life on Earth, including ourselves. Yet the way we humans are now living on Earth is sending biodiversity into a decline. We are all culpable, but it has to be said, though through no fault of our own, 
It is only in the last few decades that we have come to understand that every one of us has been born into a human world that was always inherently unsustainable. But now that we do know this, we have a clear, we have a choice to make. We could carry on living our happy lives, raising our families, busying ourselves with the honest pursuits of the modern society that we have built, whilst choosing to disregard the disaster waiting on our doorstep, or we could change. This choice is far from straightforward. It is, after all, only human to cling tightly to what we know and discount or fear what we don't. Every morning, the first thing the people of Pripyat would have seen on drawing back the curtains in their apartments was the giant nuclear power station that would one day destroy their lives. Most of the inhabitants worked there. That The remainder relied on those who did for their livelihoods. Many would have understood the dangers of living so close to it, yet I doubt whether any would have chosen to switch the reactors off. Chernobyl had brought them that pre precious commodity, a comfortable life. We are all people of Pripyat now. We live our comfortable lives in the shadow of a disaster of our own making. That disaster is being brought about by the very things that allow us to live our comfortable lives. And it is quite natural to carry on in this way until there is a convincing reason not to do so and a very good plan for an alternative. That is why I have written this book. The natural world is fading. The evidence is all around. It has happened during my lifetime. I have seen it with my own eyes. It will lead to our destruction. Yet there is still time to switch off the reactor. There is a good alternative. This book is the story of how we came to make this our greatest mistake and how, if we act now, we can yet put it right. Part 1. My Witness Statement As I write this, I am 94. I have had the most extraordinary life. It is only now that I appreciate how extraordinary. I have been lucky enough to spend my life exploring the wild places of our planet and making films about the creatures that live there. In doing so, I have traveled widely around the globe. I have experienced the living world firsthand in all its variety and wonder and witnessed some of its greatest spectacles and most gripping dramas. As a boy, I dreamed, like so many others, of traveling to distant wilder places to look at the natural world in its pristine state and even find animals that were new to science. Now I find it hard to believe that I have managed to spend so much of my life doing exactly that. 1937. World population, 2.3 billion. Carbon in the atmosphere, 280 parts per million. Remaining wilderness, 66%. When I was 11 years old, I lived in Leicester in the middle of England. At, the t at that time, it wasn't unusual for a boy of my age to get on a bicycle, ride off into the countryside, and spend a whole day away from home. And that is what I did. Every child explores, just turning over a stone and looking at the animals beneath us exploring. It never occurred to me to be anything other than fascinated when watching what was going on in the natural world around me. My elder brother had another view. Leicester had an amateur drama dramatic society that put on productions of near professional standards, and although he persuaded me every now and then to join him and speak a couple of lines and walk on parts, my heart was not in it. Instead, as soon as the weather was warm enough, I would cycle off to the eastern part of the county where the, there were rocks full of beautiful and intriguing fossils. They were not, it is true, the bones of dinosaurs. The honey-colored limestone had been deposited as mud at the bottom of an ancient sea, so no one could expect to find the remains of such land-living monsters in them. I instead discovered the shells of sea-living creatures, ammonites, some six inches or so across, coiled like ram's horns, others the size of hazelnuts, inside which were tiny scaffolds of calcite that had supported the gills which, with which the creatures within had breathed. And I had... And I knew of no greater thrill than picking up a likely-looking boulder, giving a smart blow with a hammer, and watching it fall apart to reveal one of these marvelous shells glinting in the sunlight. And I reveled in the thought that the first human eyes to gaze upon it were mine. That's what they looked like. I had believed from a very early stage that the most important knowledge was that which brought an understanding of how the natural world worked. It was not laws invented by human beings that interested me, but the principles that govern the lives of animals and plants, not the history of kings and queens, or even the languages, different languages that had been developed by different human societies, but the truths that had governed the world around me long before humanity had e appeared on it. Why were there so many different kinds of ammonites? Why was this one different from that? Did it live in a different way? Did it live in a different area? I soon discovered that plenty of other people had asked much, had asked such questions and had found a lot of the answers, and that these answers could be put together to form the most marvelous of all stories, the history of life. The story of the development of life on Earth is one of the most is for the most part one of slow, steady change. Every creature whose remains I found in the rocks had spent its entire life being tested by its environment. Those that happened to be better at surviving and reproducing passed on their characteristics. Those that didn't, couldn't. Over billions of years, life forms slowly changed and became more complex, more efficient, often more specialized, and their long story, detail by detail, could be deduced from what could be found in the rocks. The Leicestershire limestones had recorded only a tiny moment of it, but more chapters could be found in the specimens that this that the city's museum had on display, and to find out yet more, I decided, when the time came, that I would try to go to university. 
There, I learned another truth. This long story of gradual change had been violently interrupted at points. Every hundred million years or so, after all those painstaking selections and improvements, something catastrophic happened, a mass extinction. For different reasons at different times in the Earth's history, there had been a profound, rapid global change to the environment to which so many species had become so exquisitely adapted. The Earth's life support machine had started, and the miraculous assemblage of fragile interconnections which held it together had collapsed. Great numbers of species suddenly disappeared, leaving only a few. All that evolution was undone. These monumental extinctions created boundaries on the rocks that you could see if you knew where to look and how to recognize them. Below the boundary, there were many different life forms. Above, very few. Such mass extinctions have happened few to five times in life's four billion year history. Each time, nature has collapsed, leaving just enough survivors to start the process once more. The last time it happened, it is thought that the that a meteorite over 10 kilometers in diameter struck the Earth's surface with an impact two million times more powerful than the largest hydrogen bomb ever tested. It landed in a bed of gypsum, so some think. It sent sulfur high into the atmosphere to fall across the globe as rain sufficiently acidic to kill vegetation and dissolve the bodies of plankton in the surface waters of the oceans. The dust cloud that rose arose blocked the, sun, the light from the sun to such a degree that it may have reduced the rate of plant growth for several years. Flaming remnants of the blast may have just showered back to Earth, causing firestorms across the Western Hemisphere. The burning world would have added carbon dioxide and smoke to the already polluted air, warming the Earth through a greenhouse effect. And because the meteorite landed on the coast, it initiated colossal tsunamis that swept across the globe, destroying coastal ecosystems and sending marine sand and marine sand significant distances inland. It was an event that changed the course of natural history, wiping out three quarters of all species, including anything on land larger than the size of a domestic dog. It ended the 175 million year reign of the dinosaurs. Life would have to rebuild. For 66 million years since then, nature has been at work reconstructing the living world, recreating and refining a new diversity of species. And one of the products of this rebooting of life was humanity. Our own evolution is also recorded in the rocks. Fossils of our close ancestors are much rarer than those of Ammonites because they first evolved only 2 million years ago. And there is a further difficulty. The remains of land-living animals are not, for the most part, sealed away beneath accumulating sediments as the, are those of marine creatures. Instead, they are smashed by the destructive powers of the baking sun, the driving rain, and frost. But they do exist, and the few remains we have found of our ancestors show that we first evolved in Africa. As we did so, our brains began to increase in size at such a rate as to suggest that we were acquiring one of our most characteristic features, a capacity to develop, to develop cultures to a unique degree. To an evolutionary biologist, the term culture describes the information that can be passed from one individual to another by teaching or imitation. Copying the ideas or actions of others seems to, be, to us to be easy, but that's because we excel at it. Only a handful of other species show any signs of having a culture. Chimpanzees and bottomless dolphins are two of them, but no other species has anything approaching the capacity for culture that we have. Culture transformed the way we evolved. It was a new way by which our species became adapted for life on Earth. Whereas other species depended on physical changes over generations, we could produce an idea that brought significant change within a generation. Tricks such as finding the plants that yield water even during a drought, crafting a stone tool for skinning a kill, lighting a fire or cooking a meal, could be passed from one human to another during a single lifetime. It was a new form of inheritance that didn't rely on genes which an individual received from his parents. So now the pace of our change increased. Our ancestors' brains expanded at extraordinary speed, enabling us to learn, store, and spread ideas. But ultimately, the physical changes in their bodies slowed almost to a halt. By some 200,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans, homo sapiens, people like you and me, had appeared. We have changed physically very little since then. What has changed spectacularly is our culture. At the beginning of our existence as a species, our culture was centered upon a lifestyle of hunting and gathering. We were exceptionally good at both. We equipped ourselves with the material products of our culture, such as hooks to catch fish and knives to butcher deer. We learned how to cult control fire for cooking and use stones to grind grain. But despite our ingenious culture, our lives were not easy. The environment was harsh and, more importantly, unpredictable. The world in general was a lot colder than now. The sea level was much lower. Fresh water was harder to find, and global temperatures fluctuated greatly within relatively short periods of time. We may have had bodies and brains very like those we have now, but because the environment was so unstable, it was hard to survive. Data from genetic studies of modern-day humans suggest that, in fact, 70,000 years ago, those climatic hazards left us, us susceptible to events that nearly eliminate, exterminated us. Our entire species may have been reduced to as few as 20,000 fertile adults. If we were to develop much further, we needed, we needed a little stability. The retreat of the last glaciers 11,700 years ago brought that stability. 
The Holocene, the part of the Earth's history that we think of as our time, has been one of the most stable periods in our planet's long history. For 10,000 years, the average global temperature did not vary up or down by more than one degree Celsius. We don't know exactly what produced this stability, but the richness of the living world may well have had something to do with it. Phytoplankton, microscopic plants floating near the ocean surface and vast forests extending right around the globe in the north, locked away a great deal of carbon and so helped to maintain a balanced level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Huge herds of grazing animals kept the grasslands rich and productive by fertilizing the soils and stimulated new growth by grazing them. Mangrove swamps and coral reefs along the coast provided nurseries for young fish that, when mature, ranged in open waters and enriched the ocean's ecosystems. A dense, multi-layered belt of rainforest around the equator harnessed the sun's energy and added moisture and oxygen to the global air currents. And great, wide expanses of snow and ice at the northern and southern ends of the Earth reflected sunlight back into space, cooling the whole Earth like a, like, like a gigantic air conditioner. So, the flourishing biodiversity of the Holocene helped to moderate the global temperatures of Earth, and the living world set up into a gentle, reliable annual rhythm the seasons. On the tropical plains, dry and rainy seasons alternated with clockwork regularity. In Asia and Oceania, the winds changed direction at the same time each year, delivering the monsoon on cue. In northern regions, the temperatures rose above 15 degrees Celsius in March, triggering spring, and then stayed high until October when they dipped and brought autumn. The Holocene was our Garden of Eden. Its rhythm of season was so reliable that it gave our species the opportunities we needed, and we took advantage of them. Almost as soon as the environment stabilized, groups of people living in the Middle East began to abandon their abandoned gathering plants and hunting animals, and took to a completely new way of life. They started to farm. The change was not deliberate. It did not happen by design. The path to agriculture was long, haphazard, and accidental, and due more to luck than to foresight. In the Middle East, the land had all the characteristics needed for such happy accidents. They lie on the crossroads between three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. So, for millions of years, species of plants and animals from all three have been both passed through and established themselves there. The hillsides and floodplains were colonized by plants such as the wild ancestors, ancestors of today's wheat, barley, chickpea, peas, and lentils, all species that produce seeds so rich in nutriment they can survive the prolonged dry seasons. Such edible morsels must have, must have attracted people every year if they were able to gather more seeds than they needed to immediately. They doubtless stored them, as some other mammals and birds do, so that they could be eaten during the winter when food is scarce. At some point, the hunter-gatherers stopped their wanderings and settled down, securing the knowledge that their stored seeds would provide them with food when nothing else was easily available. Wild cattle, goats, sheep, and pigs all existed naturally in this region. Initially, they must have been taken from the wild, but they too became domesticated within a few thousand years of the start of the Holocene. Again, there will have been many intermediate and doubtless unintentional steps in the journey from wild to tame. At first, the hunters selected males to kill and protected breeding females in order to boost the populations. Evidence for this has been found by scientists studying the bones of animals around ancient village sites. The humans may also have chased off other animal predators or lived with without meat entirely for periods of the year to maintain the wild stock. Ultimately, they not only caught but kept animals alive for long periods and, and began to breed them, inevitably selecting as their stock those individuals that were less aggressive and more tolerant. With time, all of these developments were enhanced by other innovations, building grain stores, herding, drink, digging irrigation channels, tilling and planting, adding manure. Agriculture had arrived. Perhaps the advent of farming was almost in inevitable when a species as intelligent and as inventive as ours met a climate as stable as the Holocene's. Certainly, the habit of farming st started independently in at least 11 separate regions around the world, gradually, de gradually developing cultivated strains of a wide variety of uh, sorry, of a very wide range of crops, including familiar ones like potatoes, maize, rice, and sugarcane, and had domesticated animals such as donkeys, chickens, llamas, and bees. Farming transformed the relationship between humankind and nature. We were, in a very small way, taming a part of the wild world, controlling our environment to a modest degree. We built walls to protect plants from the wind. We shaded our animals from the sun by planting the trees. Using their manure, we fertilized the land when they grazed it. We ensured that our crops flourished in times of drought, keeping them watered by building channels from rivers and lakes. We removed plants that competed with the ones we found useful and covered whole hillsides with those we particularly favored. Both the animals and the plants we selected in this way also began to change. As we protected the grazing animals, they no longer needed to guard against attacks from predators or fight for access to females. We weeded our plots so that our food plants could grow without competition from other species and get all the nitrogen, water, and sunlight they needed. <coughs> they produced larger grains and bigger fruits and tubers. The animals became more biddable as we took away their needs for wariness and aggression. Their ears flopped, their tails curled, they continued to make the yapping, bleeding, and whining noise of the younger years, even when they were mature, perhaps because in many ways they were eternally youthful. 
being fed and protected by us, their surrogate parents. And we were also changing from a species that was molded by nature into one that had the ability to mold other species to match its own requirements. The farmer's work was hard. It suffered frequent droughts and famine, but eventually they were able to produce more than they needed for their own immediate requirements. Compared to their hunter-gatherer neighbors, they were able to raise bigger families. These extra sons and daughters were useful not only to tend the crops and livestock, but to assist the family in retaining possession of its fields. Farming made land more valuable than it had been in its wild state, and the farmers began to build more permanent shelters to maintain their claims. The plots belonging to different families inevitably varied in soil type, water, avail water availability, and aspect. So some crops and herds fared better than others. After feeding the family, family, the farmers were able to use any surplus to trade. Farming communities came together came to gather at open markets to barter their wares. They began to exchange food for other assets and for skills. The farmers needed stone, twine, oil, and fish. They wanted the, the products of carpenters, masons, and toolmakers, who now for the first time were able to trade for food rather than spending time growing it. As the number of trades increased, the markets developed into towns and then cities in many of the fertile river valleys. As each new valley was settled, some farmers moved to the next in search of fresh fields. Neighboring tribes of hunter-gatherers trading with the farming communities merged with them as they grew, and the practice of farming spread at the speed of up the rivers into every watershed. Civilization had started. It gathered, gathered pace with each generation and with each technical innovation. Water power, steam power, electrification were invented and refined, and eventually all the achievements with which we are familiar today were established. But each generation in these ever more complex societies was able to develop and progress only because the natural world continued to be stable and could be relied upon to deliver the commodities and the conditions that we needed. The benign environment of the Holocene and the marvelous biodiversity that guaranteed it became more important to us than ever. And that's all for today. Meh.